botanists in Israel are looking for the key to spikenard. The plants that existed at the time of Christ when this was written, uh, they're not sure exist anymore, maybe not at least in the same form. And so the formula for the perfume that this woman poured upon Jesus has long been lost. There are those who believe great wealth can return to Israel uh, if this could be rediscovered. And if you've been to the Middle East or Europe in general, you know how important perfumes can be. Uh, the markets are filled with them. And uh, perfumes are used, of course, for different things. It would be very convenient to connect the spikenard of the woman's alabaster jar to the myrrh that was brought to Jesus by one of the three wise men uh, after his birth. But they're different sorts of substances, both precious, uh, one used for, uh, both in fact sometimes used for burial, but myrrh specifically more for burial, and spikenard was this obviously precious perfume. So what's going on in this story? We hear it from a variety of angles from different kinds of our gospel writers. That is to say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they have different takes on this slightly where it is, where it is published. So let's just uh, note where we find this story. We find it in all four gospels. It's in Matthew 26, it's in Luke 22, and it's in John 12 each of them with a slight variation on the story. What we know is that this woman did the act that's described in Mark. Other Gospels fill in a few details for us. There's a quote Jesus gives to the one who's been forgiven much, then much love follows that, so to speak. There's the idea that um, Simon whose home they were eating at, had not welcomed Jesus. But this woman had not uh, only anointed him, but kissed him and made him very welcome. Mark's intention, it seems to me in this story, is to contrast again the understanding of the disciples as they exist formally, in this case Judas Iscariot, and to contrast that with the understanding uh, and simple faith and simple act of, of giving that this woman expresses. The difference is held as a contrast. So we'll get to that in just a minute in the next section that we, we read and I highlight. I want to apologize. I, I did not catch uh, the way in which the bulletin heading was listed. It should say, uh, Jesus the Son of God, because that's the final iteration of this series that we've been on. And uh, we'll get to that in the conclusion today very shortly. For me, this story concentrates a couple of very important ideas. And I, I'm just, just going to throw these out and see how they resonate with you. The first is that for this woman, whatever her interaction, whoever she actually was, for this woman, what Jesus had done for her was worth a gesture, a gesture that required significant financial outpouring. And I wonder at our own gestures of gratitude. I wonder at my own responsiveness along those lines. If Jesus has given everything for me, if he's done all for me, if Christ has poured himself out ultimately for me, what's my response? A dollar here, a dollar there. This woman's response was to take something precious, something expensive, and not take a dabber and put a little under his ears or smear a little on his hair. She poured it out. Can you imagine the... Well, we might even think of it as a stench, right? Can you imagine the overwhelming nature of that fragrance as it filled the space? Jesus, the other thing I'm struck by is Jesus' response. How many of us don't like to be fussed over at all? Very little. You don't really like to be fussed over. Oh, all of you like to be fussed over? <laughs> Excellent. This will be harder for you to relate to or not. Maybe it'll be very easy for you to relate to. Jesus accepted the fussing over. 
He didn't eschew it. He didn't criticize it. He didn't second guess it. He didn't try to control it. He didn't try to manipulate or manage it. He didn't condemn it. He accepted it. And that tells me something very important about Jesus. When you're ready to give him a gift, when you're ready to acknowledge what he's done for you, he'll be ready to receive it, whatever that is. Jesus is ready to receive your gift, your praise, your love, your tears. Jesus is ready to accept your perfume as you pour it out over his life. The third thing that uh, this pericope, tell, uh, pericope, we covered that word before, but for the sake of review, that section of Scripture that deals with this anointing of the woman would be called a pericope. Uh, that little section of Scripture that we're dealing with in this reading focuses on something else, too. It is a contrast of spirits between a controlling heart and a grateful heart between a, a heart that seeks uh, to manipulate a system or to find a space of gain or position or honor and a heart that's willing to be humble and poured out. And most of all, it highlights the difference between what it is that she seems to have grasped and what it is the disciples failed to understand. Because remember, when we speak of not just the disciples, but all who followed Jesus, there was seeing and there was seeing vision. There was hearing and there was hearing that took place. And the discernment factor was a spiritual gift. Here's a woman who saw and understood. Listen to Jesus' words. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them at any time you want. But you won't always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare it for my burial. I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. In preparation for my burial, Jesus the King has come. He's ridden into Jerusalem. His time is incredibly short. He has warned the disciples time and time again. He has made outrageous statements. See this temple? I will tear it down, and in three days I will build it back up. By the way, those who heard those words had a very literal read on them as well. What? You're going to take a structure and tear it down, a structure that took 40-plus years to build, and you're going to build it in three days? You're a liar, a lunatic. You're a blasphemer. That was the response to Jesus' words. But Jesus wasn't referring to the literal temple. God doesn't live in places made of stone. God lives in the fleshy places of our hearts. And they didn't comprehend. They didn't understand. In fact, they sought to kill Jesus for these kinds of claims and words. Time and time again, Jesus revealed to the disciples, I'm going to to die, and in three days I will raise again. Or I, he at least indicated his death, didn't he, multiple times in our readings. They didn't want to accept it. This confused them. It didn't fit the pattern. And yet this woman, who remains anonymous in this particular passage, prepares Jesus for a burial to come. What are we missing what are we not hearing? What's wrong with our own vision that so many times Jesus has something to say to us and we have no receptors to receive it? Mark's gospel is taking us through a conversion in which people who didn't know who Jesus was would one day come to the most profound understanding. 
an understanding so profound that at the end of their own journeys, they themselves would all, with one exception, lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. Crucified upside down, beheaded, terrible deaths, and they would do it because they finally had a vision for who Jesus was. The disciples are about themselves to be converted. And this is the journey so many of us must make, particularly the journey of people who've been raised inside the church. Our conversion is a gradual thing. We move from a culture of faith, a cultural Adventism, if you will, to a faith that we own that belongs to us. Something inside, something that no one can take away, a personal vision that comes from having heard and having seen and having journeyed and having finally believed. We talk about this woman to this day because in her simple adoration, gratitude, faith, love, she poured herself out and 2,000 years later, Nearly 2 billion people on the planet still talk about her. From the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus and to kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. While they were reclining at the table eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. You will fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. Returning a third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting, that's enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, teachers, and elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and gave him a kiss. It might just be the most profound misapprehension of history. Judas may not have even been poorly intentioned. There's plenty of evidence that Judas was seeking to force Jesus' hand. That if Jesus was in fact arrested and was in fact tried, he would not only admit to being king, but would emerge as king and begin to use his powers in a kingly way. And the Romans would be driven from Israel. And Israel would be returned to the glory of the age of David and Solomon. 
and all would be well, for the Messiah would have come, and the Messiah would reign in peace and glory. It's interesting that the words that were just read, which I've organized into kind of a storyline of its own, because there's lots of other texts in that entire chapter, which we don't have time to read. But it's interesting that set in the context of people looking for a way to crucify Jesus is the story of the woman who anoints him that we just looked at. And right after it, immediately after that story, Judas's response to her generosity in Mark's gospel, Judas's response to her outpouring of love was to present himself to the priest as one who would betray Jesus. It's interesting that we're rarely stabbed in the back by someone we don't know. We're rarely betrayed by someone who's not close to us. In fact, that might just be impossible. We know who our enemies are, and we generally try to keep them at a distance. We are betrayed by those we love, and we are betrayed by those we think love us. And so it is with this this, this Christian greeting, this Middle Eastern greeting of hospitality. Greet one another with a kiss, Scripture says. And so it is that Jesus is greeted by Judas, the betrayer. The arrest will follow and the crucifixion, and Judas will end up hanging himself, dropping off of his hanging rope down a cliff and being disemboweled. He'll be buried in a field that's purchased with the betrayal price, and the gospel will go forward. A new disciple will eventually be voted in, and the upper room experience will take place with the Holy Spirit coming upon those who have grieved and those who have prayed in that space. Those who've come to a different vision and a new understanding of who Jesus was. We don't want to be in the group of betrayers. So today I invite us all to surrender our personal agendas for Jesus. I invite us all to surrender our corporate agendas for Jesus. I invite us all to surrender our political aspirations for Jesus. Let's listen. Let's learn. Let's sit at his feet. Let's take him at his word. Let's trust. Let's, let's hope. And above all, let's pray. Not falling asleep not failing him in his hour of trial. And even as I say these words of exhortation, in a way, it's too late. It's already happened. I have betrayed the master. You've betrayed the master. We have acted in ways that are contrary to faith and grace and hope. We've acted in ways that are contrary to the Spirit who is with us and given us. We've acted in ways that are faithless and blind like the disciples. The story is told not to make them look stupid. They weren't. We know the disciples, Peter in Jerusalem and Paul in the World Church, went out and founded a movement based on the teachings of, Judah, of Jesus that had been rejected by Judaism by and large. The reform he had hoped to bring to a faith did not take. Instead, it emerged as a denomination in which we now participate, a religion we participate in, Christianity. We know that these men were not deficient as human people go. They were human people who did not see and did not hear and who slept when Jesus said, watch with me. That's us. But the story doesn't end with this. The story ends with something great, and Mark's gospel isn't actually going to take us to that moment. It's going to take us to something interesting and profound. 
it's going to take us to a conclusion that isn't derived at by any of Jesus' followers. It's derived at by the enemy. Listen as we read the next passage. To make sure we're all still sitting here when one thirty rolls around, I'll be reading the whole Gospel of Mark, plus or minus 559 verses. Uh, selections from Mark 15. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes. They led him out to crucify him. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one, is, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah this king of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. In many a sermon, I've spent time focusing on the physical torture that Jesus endured, focusing on the beating, focusing on the cross that he had to carry focusing on the, the torture of crucifixion itself. It's not misplaced, but Mark's gospel is instructive because the focus isn't on the physical torture, which was profound and overwhelming and fatal. What Mark's gospel focuses on is the cruelty of the people who inflicted this pain. What Mark's gospel focuses on is the jeering and the rejoicing and the clapping and the angry mob. What this gospel focuses on is the way in which Jesus is tortured to death. This gospel focuses on the betrayal and the way in which he was seized and you get a picture in Mark's gospel that's crystal clear. You can imagine it. You see, the problem was Herod had built a palace in Jerusalem that was taller than the temple. The Jews hated that. But Herod, as half Jewish and a sympathizer, he wanted, Herod, he was Herod the Great, Herod the Builder, wanted to build a temple. So he built the temple in Jerusalem right next to the palace. It's in the north east corner of the city. And where the palace is, that's where the guard for Herod and for the Roman uh, leadership was, and it was called the Praetorian Guard. And the Praetorian Guard were particularly well-trained soldiers, kind of like the elite 
that guards our president today. And these Praetorian Guard got a hold of Jesus because he wasn't an average prisoner. He was a political prisoner. And the Roman Empire had no patience for would-be kings. There is one king, and his name is Caesar. Hail Caesar. And you worship Caesar. That was the law of the land. King God. The Jews, of course, would not do that. They were monotheistic and focused on the worship of the true God. But Jesus the king is taken by the Praetorian guard into the Praetorian court and spit upon and beaten with a stick and hit with fists. A crown of thorns is dug into his skull and the blood flows freely. Mark doesn't focus so much on the whipping that he endured, but you get this picture of a group of soldiers who are harassing him and worse, not the physical piece, but harassing him and mocking him as king of the Jews. A king should have power. A king should have protection. A king should have a degree of authority and command. And they diminish that in every way. They tear him down to nothing. He's a dog to be kicked and spit upon. Not just a dog, a mangy dog to be kicked and spit upon. He's dragged around a kangaroo court and ultimately crucified. And the Jews who, are, who have called for his crucifixion and said, set Barabbas free, not Jesus, those same Jews are now mocking him. You helped others, can't you help yourself? Come on, big guy, show us what you've got. They too participate in the cruelty, in the diminishment. They too try to drag down his greatness. They too mock it. Is this the guy who said he could tear down the temple and in three days rebuild it? Look at him now, naked and shaking on a tree. The Jews who were insurrectionists, in whose camp Jesus is placed, he is a rebel. The rebels, and that's a better translation than thief, by the way. We always talk about the two thieves. Rebel is a better translation. They were insurrectionists, crucified to make a point to all of the people who came in and out of that city and in and out of that temple. We here in Rome take care of the rebels. And these two insurrectionists mock Jesus until we have in another account of one of them saying, remember me. Mark's perspective is that the whole world hasn't got a clue. He is king of the Jews, but not in the manner that Rome understands. It takes his death, his crying out to God in the most pitiable Plaintiff chai of a broken child. My God, my God, or Abba, Father, Abba, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? And in this forsaken cry, he lays down his life and breathes his last. It is not one of his Friends on either side, I say friends advisedly, on either side being crucified with him who says who he is. It's not the crowd that has jeered him. It's not the populace of Israel. It's not the Praetorium Guard. It's not the disciples. They have scattered and run. And it's not the women who tended to him who watched from a distance. Mark's gospel takes a Gentile, a crucifier, a centurion, a hated outsider, and this man says, having seen Jesus die, surely, definitively, this was indeed 
the Son of God. If you look in Mark 15, that's where the story of the crucifixion ends. Mark goes on to tell of the burial of Jesus, and he goes on to tell briefly of the resurrection of Jesus. It's not anywhere near as long as Matthew or Luke's accounts. It's a footnote, comparatively. But it is this confession on which the disciples will eventually reconvene. They will eventually come back together. They will remember the texts that Jesus referenced in the old, what we call the Old Testament, in their Bible, about the prophecies that would be fulfilled in the one to come, the anointed one of Israel. They remembered Jesus' words and saw application and fulfillment. And through prayer and inside of the Spirit, they were eventually emboldened to proclaim what a Gentile Roman centurion had proclaimed, surely this was the Son of God. I pray, as I conclude this series, that that is your confession as well. That after the journey from understanding Jesus as just an interesting teacher, to seeing him as a teacher with shmika, with power, to seeing him as a prophet, to understanding the ways in which he might have fulfilled the messianic predictions and prophecies, to hearing Jesus' self-descriptors using the terms of Ezekiel, Daniel, and Revelation as son of man, prophetic and messianic and priestly, to the declaration, Jesus, son of David, king in the line of David, Jesus, king of the Jews. And finally, the progression ends with this confession, Jesus, son of God. The light has dawned. The message has been stated. The gospel has been brought forth. And now it will be a gospel not for the Jews only, but for the Jews and the Gentiles and indeed the whole world. As the disciples were converted, I pray we might be converted. Convinced, changed, shaken, motivated, enraptured, taken, Invi invigorated, enlivened by the idea that He is Son of God, the Savior of the world, our King. And I pray that as that takes place, our congregation here will continue to move and continue to grow and continue to blossom. May God bless us to that end. Peter, I think you have a closing hymn for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for being with us this Sabbath and all Sabbaths that you're here with us. Lord, thank you for the uh, opportunity to serve with you and to come together as a family. Lord, about 11 years ago, we uh, were looking for a new pastor. And... Uh, we went through a process to find what turned out to be, lucky for us, Greg Honus, Jill Honus, and Brennan Honus. Specifically for Pastor Greg, I don't know that he knew what he was getting into, nor did most of us know what we were getting into. But Lord, it's been a blessing. For the last 10 and a half years, we've had the honor of Greg, uh, through you, Lord, Greg leading us as pastor of our church. We've grown together as a family. We've watched his family grow up, his son grow up. We've had the uh, honor of uh, serving in many ways to assist him in his pastoral leadership here, Lord. And we, uh, we trusted you, and uh, you didn't let us down. We thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Also, God, we think about Greg moving forward into a new role, into a new capacity, and facing new challenges. So we know that with you, he is up for it. But we also take this moment to ask for your blessing, your strength, 
your encouragement, add to his discernment, add to his judgment. Help him to be leaning on you and to hold on to you as he holds on to each of the groups that are in his charge. And may you continually walk with him and give him the confidence that he doesn't have to be nervous, he doesn't have to be concerned because you are always with him. Amen. Help us all to remember that, that you go with us. So for all these blessings and for the blessings that are still to come, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And so today, Lord, we stand in the oneness of your love. And we lift up our friend and our pastor, Pastor Greg and his family. We thank him for the service and ministry and love that he and his family have shared. And in the oneness of the same love, Lord, we release him, we let him go. And with that same love, we know that you will walk with him in the ministry that lies before him. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you all. And so I leave you with this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.